As I said this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of a matter of the heart. And it really is a matter of the heart. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells us that no man can serve two masters, for either he'll love the one and despise the other. And it also says in the book of Matthew that where your heart is, there is your treasure also. So I asked you this morning, where is your heart? Do you love God? And I don't mean, you know, it, it's so easy, it, it's so glib to say that I love the Lord. But do I love the Lord enough to place my complete trust in him? That when I honor him with my first fruit, with my tithe, that I am saying, Lord, I'm not just giving you some leftover money that I have. I'm not just giving you, Lord, because I'm expected to give. I'm not just giving you, Lord, you know, whatever amount it is that you place in the offering, but I'm giving you the first fruit. I'm giving you the first tenth. The very first check that I make out, I get paid once a month. The very first check I make out is my tithe check, and I'll tell you why. In my mind, that's not my money. I've settled that issue a long time ago. That's, it, it's God's. It belongs to him. And as a result of having that mentality or whatever, I'm not tempted to use it for myself and to not honor the Lord. And one thing I can tell you, I've done this ever since I was a child. God's never failed me. That 90% with God's blessing, has always gone farther than the 100%. I can't tell you how. I can't sit down and show you on paper or whatever, but I can tell you this. My needs, not my wants, but my needs have always been supplied as a result of honoring the Lord. As a congregation, we have a very good group of people here. About 38% of you tithe regularly consistently, and lest you think, well, the pastor's been looking at the tithing records. No, I haven't. So if today I happen to look at you when I'm preaching, I don't know what you give. So let's get that established, okay? I, I, I purposely do that. Uh, there's only one time that I've ever done it. And I purposely do that because I know the nature of Jeff. If I got up here and preached on tithing, and some of you weren't tithing, unconsciously, I probably would stare a hole for you. And I'm going to look at the floor right now, so no one thinks I'm, you know, I'm staring at him right now. But I probably would unconsciously stare a hole for you and say, is the Holy Spirit convicting you yet? But, but that's, that's not my point. I don't want you to give because Pastor Jeff's asking you to give. I'm not asking today that you give because I'm trying to lay a guilt trip on you. I'm asking you today to understand the promises of God's word that if you are a tither, God will bless you in many, many wonderful ways, not just financially, but in many ways. And we're gonna look at that in scripture today. Two Irishmen who were traveling in the Holy Land came to the Sea of Galilee and they soon discovered to their dismay that it would cost each of them $50 to cross the lake by boat. Immediately, they cried out in protest. The lakes of Killarney are the most beautiful lakes in the world, and you can cross them for just a few dollars, the one man explained. The guide replied, oh, but this, my friend, is the lake that Jesus walked on. The other Irishman quickly looked to his friend and responded, no wonder at the prices they charged to take a boat. <laughs> Money. Workers earn it. Bankers lend it, taxes take it, dying leaves it behind, heirs receive it, and we all wish that we had more of it. But the critical question that I want to begin with this morning is this, how do we use it? Because what we spend our money on shows our values. I want you to take a moment to preview, if you would, the following video as J. John shares with a group of people about, he's answering two questions. First of all, what do preachers do? And then also, why the church exists. So pay attention if you would.
People often say to me, they say, J. John, you know, wh what do you do? And it's always very difficult to know what to say. Because if I say to you that I'm a reverend, which I am, that conjures up certain images in people's minds as to what I might be. <laughs> so I like to be a little bit creative in telling people what I do. I sat next to this lady on an aeroplane at Heathrow Airport and I said, hello. And she said, oh, hello. And I said, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to Singapore. Then she said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Australia. I said, what do you do? So she told me. Then she said, what do you do? And I said, well, <laughs> I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. She said, have you? I said, yes, we have. I said, we've got hospitals and hospices and homeless shelters. I said, we do marriage work. We've got orphanages. We've got feeding programs, educational programs. I said, we do all sorts of justice and reconciliation things. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death <laughs> and we deal in the area of behavioural alteration. <laughs> She went, wow! <laughs> and it was so loud, her wow, loads of people turned around and looked at us. She says, what's it called? <laughs> I said, it's called the church. <laughs> If we are a follower of Jesus, wow. then we are part of a global That's enterprise. Right. But not only is it global, it's intergalactic because it includes everyone that's gone before us. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that what the church is about? I mean, really it is. And none of those things are possible without our faithfulness in giving. It, it's more than just assembling together here on a Sunday morning. It's more than just having a local building that we go to. The church is made up of people. People being visible representation of God's love, of God's presence to those around them. Now, if you're a first-time guest here today, and as I look around, I see some new faces, I want you to know we don't preach on money here every Sunday. In fact, this is the first time I've preached on money this year. So here it is, September 13th. How many of you would say that's pretty good? Amen? But at the same time, I recognize my obligation or my responsibility, I guess is better, a better word, as your pastor, to help you understand the significance, the importance of honoring God with our first fruit and being a faithful giver and not doing it reluctantly, not doing it hesitantly, or not doing it out of necessity or obligation. But because, again, it's a matter of the heart, I do it because I want to. I want to. I recognize God for who he is, and I love God more than my money. I love God more than my possessions. I love God more than anything, more than life itself. And he is worthy, not only of my tithe, but of my offerings as well. You know, Jesus talked a great deal about money and the problems that it caused individuals. In fact, 16 of the 38 parables that you read about in the gospels deal with the subject of how to handle money and possessions. The Bible has 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. So it's easy to understand that money is a very important topic. Most people hate sermons on money because money is one of the most acid tests of Christian character. It really talks about where my love is. It really speaks about where is it that I place my priorities However, if we are to be blessed by God, we must obey his instructions concerning the use of money. And I want to read in your hearing today two passages of scripture, one from the old and one from the new. And they're probably a little bit different than what you're used to hearing when you hear sermons on tithing. But I want you to listen very carefully to the words. The first is found in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. And notice Moses speaking here. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. 
and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as in this day. And then turning over to James chapter 1, looking together at verses 17 and 18, James says this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You know, it's critical that we understand that what we have is ultimately not ours. It all belongs to God. To put it in another way, we need to determine within ourselves, am I the owner of what I have or am I the manager of what I have? And when I understand that everything that I possess, anything that I ever will possess, already belongs to God, and God has given it to me to oversee as a manager of that, knowing that one day I'm going to be held accountable with how I managed or how I handled that which God entrusted me with. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, we read that it is God who gives us the power to get the wealth. Now, I had a person tell me one time, they said, look, I'm the one who sweated, I'm the one who toiled, I'm the one that got out of bed early in the morning, I'm the one that goes into the sweat factory every day, and I've earned everything that I make. And you're right, you do. But who gives you the strength to get out of bed? Who gives you the ability to be able to walk into the workplace and be able to do the task or the tour or the chore rather that you are called upon to do? Who blesses you with good health that you're able to work and, and to bring home a paycheck? Is it not God? You see, he's the one that, that gives me the ability to earn the wealth and the possessions that I have. And so it would go without saying that every individual, whether young or old, who has some means of income, has a responsibility to return a tithe to the Lord as a sign of their commitment. Boy, that's a word that people don't like to hear anymore, isn't it? Commitment. But commitment to the Lord, commitment to the fact that I'm recognizing, Lord, everything that I have. And it is a privilege, it is an honor, Lord, for me to bring the first fruit of my offering, of my tithe to you. Out of what I've possessed, Lord, I recognize that the first tenth of that is yours. And then, if the truth of the matter were known, I really haven't given anything to God when I tithe. It's my offering over and above the tithe that really is what I'm giving. I didn't expect to hear a lot of amens on that, but it's truth. It's biblical truth. We find out that it not only is a sign of commitment, but it's also a sign of obedience and a desire to see God glorified. It's all about him, glorifying the Lord. I don't know about you, but I never want to be guilty of standing before the Lord with his money in my pocket. Think about that. We're all going to stand before the Lord one day. You can say, well, I don't believe in God. You can say, I don't believe in heaven or whatever. But friends, just me denying it, just me saying that it doesn't exist, doesn't make it a re I mean, does not cease to make it a reality. We will all one day stand before the Lord and give an account of our lives. It's mentioned in scripture on several different places. And like I said, I don't want to be standing before the Lord with his money in my pocket because I was hanging on to something that was his. You see, God's principle is that our giving is in proportion to our income. I never cease to be amazed how people can tip a waiter 15 to 20% for a meal and never complain. But when you mention tithing 10% to the church, they're quick to point out how they can't afford to tithe and all that preacher preaches about is money. We need to understand that our attitude and our actions with regard to money and giving affect our spiritual life and our spiritual growth. God has just loaned to us all that we have for our use while we're here on earth. And what we spend on ourselves is God's and what we give God was his to begin with. That critical shift in our minds from owner to manager makes all the difference in the world. You know, sad to say, many people find their value, their sense of self-worth in their material possessions. But we read in Matthew chapter 6 that earthly wealth can corrode and be taken away. There in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. You know, it never ceases to amaze me. A topic that you don't hear preached on very much is stinginess. 
Stop and think about the last time you heard a sermon preached on stinginess. But you know what stinginess is? Stinginess is nothing more than an expression of selfishness. Stinginess is nothing more than an expression of selfishness. It's having the mentality that my money, my possessions belong to me. Stinginess is another name for greed. And if we're not careful, wealth can become a replacement for God. Are you hearing me this morning? Are you with me? Wave your hand at me so I know you're awake. Okay, great. The person who didn't wave their hand, nudge him and say, wake up. He's saying some good stuff. I'm going to say that again. If we are not careful, wealth can become a replacement for God. We need to ask ourselves, what is the center of my life and what do I really live for? Am I using the things that I have for my own selfishness or am I using them to help others and most of all, to please God? Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 24, you can't serve two masters at the same time. Loving one God, you'll end up hating the other one. Friends, quite simply stated, you can't worship God in money. It just won't work. It just won't work. But scripture continues and it points out a a very, very important fact and that is this. We find out in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that God loves a cheerful giver. And if you look at that word cheerful in the original Greek, it means hilarious. It means that it gives me a joy. It is my delight. It is is a reason that I live is so that I can return a portion of that which God has blessed me with and give it joyfully as unto the Lord. I'm giving it from the abundance of my heart. So I'm not, you know... All right, I know I got to give a tie. Here, take it, God. But rather I'm saying, yeah, yes, I worship the Lord, not only in singing of songs and raising my hands and clapping my hands and not only in prayer and, and not all the other things that I do, but I joyfully give to the Lord because how does it compare in comparison to what he's done for me? Broken and spilled out of me. If I can just refer to that song. I mean, think about what Jesus Christ did for you and for me that we might escape The very thought of it just sends chills up and down my spine. Escape the sentence of being eternally separated from the presence of God for all eternity because of unrepented sin. But Jesus paid the debt for your sins and mine on the cross of Calvary. He held nothing back, praise God. And as a result of that, he was broken and spilled out for me. How can I do any less for him? In honoring him, it's it's a small thing in comparison to what he did for each and every one of us in this room. You know, possessions can control our lives if we're not careful. And the more that we obtain, the more time and effort it requires to maintain and safeguard it. I know some people who are very wealthy and and they have a lot of toys, (laughs) you know, a lot of possessions. And uh, I don't begrudge it. I'm happy for them. I really am. But I've had several individuals that I know who have had these that said, man, it takes so much time you know, to maintain these things. I mean, I have to polish, I have to wax, and I'm not gonna mention things that they have, but, but anyway, just basically the maintenance on the things they have, it takes so much of their time that they very rarely ever have the opportunity to enjoy it. And I look at that and I think, you know, if you were to give up this and you were to give up that or whatever, you might actually have time to enjoy some of the things that you have. Amen. When is enough enough? I love what, Mr. Ingersoll of Ingersoll Rand. You familiar with that company, Ingersoll Rand? They make big, heavy, earth-moving equipment. Mr. Ingersoll gave his heart to the Lord in his mid-20s. He said, when I first gave my heart to the Lord, he said, I tithe. He said, and God bless me. He said, so then I decided that I was going to give more over and above my tithe. He said, so I gave 15%. And then over the years, he he continued to give. And at the end of his life, he was giving 90% of what he made to the Lord. That's how much God had blessed him. He said, it was not only a matter of how little could I give to the Lord, but the question in my mind was how little can I hang, or how much rather can I hang on to and still justify that I really need it? Wow. What a difference in mentality. But look at how God blessed him. He was a multi-billionaire. You see, our values are expressed by what we really do, not by what we wish we had done. 
What does God see when he looks in your checkbook or on your online banking app? Have you been faithful in honoring him with your first fruit, the first tenth of your income? I've used this illustration before, but it really brings it home to me anyway. There was a missionary that went to a remote village in India. And he had spoken the night before on giving and honoring God with your first tenth. Early the next morning, just about dusk, there was a knock at his door. And as he went to answer the door, there was a little boy standing there with a huge fish in his hands. And he said, missionary, I heard you speak last night on giving to the Lord. He said, and I, I wanted to be obedient. He said, so here, I'm, I'm giving you the first fish. And the missionary said, as he looked, he noticed that the little boy didn't have any other fish. All he had was his fishing pole in his hand. And he said, well, where, where are the other fish? He said, oh, they're still down in the river. I just haven't caught them yet. Amen. That's faith. And that's what tithing is about. What I'm saying to the Lord is this, Lord, I trust you enough to honor your word. I trust you enough to honor your promises in your word, that if I will give you the first tenth, that Lord, you will meet and supply my every need according to your riches and glory. Yes. Not once, but my needs. You see, God entrusts us with money as a test. It is training for handling things of more value. A destructive myth and lie about tithing and money that Satan has propagated throughout the church is that I can't afford to tithe. But what we really are saying is I trust myself more than you, God, to provide for my needs when I don't tithe. You've ever thought about it in that light? You see, we need to understand that we tie God's hands from blessing us when we don't honor him with our faithful giving. We tie his hands because he told us, prove me now, there in Malachi chapter 3. Prove me now and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out my blessings upon you when you bring your first fruit into the house of the Lord, the storehouse of the Lord, on the first day of the week. So what I'm saying is, God, I trust you that when I give of my first, the, the, the best, I'm giving you the first tenth, not the second tenth, not the third tenth, because you know what happens when I give God another tenth besides the first tenth? Usually when I go to give him the third or the fourth tenth, it's not there. It's been spent on something else. That's why I give him the first tenth. I'm not tempted. It's gone. In my mind, it's gone. It may not be Sunday when I'm, you know, the next day may not be Sunday when I'm paid, but that's already deducted from the balance in my checkbook or in my bank app or my phone. We need to understand that just placing a dollar in the offering plate when it's passed is not tithing unless your paycheck for the week was $10. You can't take it with you, but we all can send it ahead. Quite simply stated, giving is a thermometer of our love. And scripture tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. So I ask you this morning, what is your motive in giving? Because real joy comes from generous giving. Giving generously to the Lord. Because giving is a basic characteristic of God, you'll never be able to outgive Him. Understand that God is not indifferent about you. He wants the best for you. And He has not withheld any good thing from us. Amen? Amen. He has not. The third and last point that I'd like to make this morning is this God is a giver, not a taker. God is is a giver, not a taker. You see, the issue to be settled here this morning is simply this. How do we view God? How do we see him? How do you view the Lord when you look into his face? Do you view God as a giver, or do you see him as a taker? The apostle Paul knew that this was an issue with people when it came to being a faithful and generous giver. He addresses it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would care to turn there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 we will look together at verses 6 through 14 and just make some comments on that. But notice Paul saying here in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. 
So let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God. While through the proof, while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by your prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. What Paul basically states in these verses is that the difference between a sparing giver and a generous giver is their relationship with the Lord. When you view God as a taker, you view him as someone who is always demanding more from you. And as a result of that, it drains all joy from your life. However, when you view God as the ultimate giver, flowing with inexhaustible blessings, flowing with inexhaustible grace and hope, when you have that kind of a mentality, when you look on the needs of others around you, there's an impulse to give and the desire to share what you have with others rises up within you. You want to be a participant. You want to partner with the Lord. You want his blessing upon your life and you want to be a part of the Lord's work. This impulse is called love. It's called grace. And love, quite simply stated, my friend, is simply vertical grace bent outward to other people. The great truth of this text is that God wants to be known. God wants to be trusted and loved as the giver and not the taker in this whole affair of giving. Otherwise, all of our giving would become draining. It would become burdensome and it would become legalistic. And who needs that? I don't need legalism. I don't, I don't need to give my tithe because it's a legal issue. I give because my heart is God's. And because my heart is God's, everything else that I have is God's. I recognize that the Lord indeed rules over all the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof is how the psalmist puts it there in Psalm 24, 1. And when I recognize that, I willfully, I joyfully, I hilariously give to the Lord. As we conclude, Paul finishes out this passage by mentioning three aspects of this bountiful harvest that we can expect when we sow bountifully. First, we can expect an even greater ability to be generous. The more you give, the more you'll be able to give. Have you ever noticed that to be true? I mean, hopefully all of you are tithers, but if you're not, you know, those of you who do, have you not found that to be true? The more you give, the more there is to be able to give. It has taught me to be a better steward of that which God gives me. You know, I do a lot of financial counseling with people, and honestly, I'm gonna be right up front with you. The ones who are in financial trouble, it's not that they don't make enough money, they just are not good stewards of what God has blessed them with. We overspend. We have bought into the mentality of the world. I've got this little thing in my pocketbook that's called, or in my wallet, that's called a credit card, and I can buy on credit. I can borrow from next week's paycheck. I can borrow from next month's paycheck. I can borrow from the next six weeks paycheck and get what I want rather than saving for it. I can get it now. But can I let you in on a little secret? You walk into a store with cash in your pocket, you're going to get a whole lot better deal than you are when you walk in there with a credit card. Amen. I'm telling you. Yeah. You can negotiate. I'm telling you from experience, you can. I love it when I walk in and there's something that I want to purchase and they tell me how much it is and I look the guy right in the eye and I say, you know, you and I both know that it doesn't really cost that much. And I want you to make an honest living, but I've got cash in my pocket. What's the best possible cash deal you can give me? And I love it when I, you know, it's been a while since I bought a new car, but I, but I love it when I go in to buy a car and you tell the salesman that. 
You know, well, I, I can't. I said, okay, fine. I just get up and start walking. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. I went with my daughter. They're, they're expecting a baby, and I went with her. I won't mention names, but I went to a local dealership and went in there, and I asked the guy, I said, look, what's your best cash deal? And he came back and said, this is it. This is the best I can do. And I said, well, I'm sorry. That's more than we're willing to pay. Started to get up and, and, and well, wait a minute. Let me go talk to the man. And he came back and said, nope, still too much. Did it three times. <laughs> then I turned the tables on him. I said, let me sleep on it. Oh. <laughs> it's a game. But listen, be good stewards of what God's blessed you with. Are you spending money on things you really don't need? And you be the judge of that. I mean, again, if I could get back to the financial counseling. It's amazing to me when I ask people to do up a budget. Some of them say, a budget? What's a budget? But when you do explain to them what a budget is and they bring it in and, and, and you look at it and say, do you really need this? Do you really need this? Do you really need this? And the truth of the matter is, no, I don't. And you start paying off some of those high interest credit cards. It's amazing that within, you know, an amount of time, and sometimes it takes longer than others because, hey, let's be honest, we have the ability of getting ourselves into debt head over heels if we're not careful. But be a good steward of what God has blessed you with. Second aspect that comes from this generous giving is that God gets more glory and praise. How many of you know that God gets glory when his people give generously? Amen? God gets glory when his people give generously. I love it when we have missionaries that come in and they present a need, and we respond as a congregation, and we can bless them. You would be amazed at how many missionaries, you know, I'm, I'm probably one of the most pastor, most popular pastors in the Potomac District when missionaries are there, and we go to district council, or we go to minister's retreat, or whatever. I kid you not, and, and to God be the glory, and to this church be glory. We have missionaries come up and say, hey, you know, you're not supporting me yet, and I understand you're supporting them, and them, and them, and them, and you haven't missed a payment over the past 27 years, over the past 10 years, over the past five years, or whatever it is. Hey, would you consider taking me on? That speaks very well of our church. The third aspect of our giving is the joy of seeing the needs of God's people met. Friends, there's no greater joy than being able to help those in need. We have a reputation in this community. Steve can verify it. Melinda can verify it. We have a reputation in this community that if there's a need, go to First Assembly. They'll help you. They'll help you. Not that other churches in the community don't. I'm not saying that. But we're one of the churches that people know that if it's a legitimate need, we're going to help you. And some of you in the, in the congregation here today, you know this to be a fact in your own life. We're here to help you. But you see, the reason that we're able to help you is because of the generosity and the faithfulness of people giving of their tithes and their offering. As J. John said, the reason that we're able to give help when people need medical attention is because of what's known as a benevolence fund or the need for a hospital over in Benali, Philippines, where I had the privilege of going with Dr. Sapanta. We support them $100 a month. Those people make $200 a year. They can't afford it. But because of our faithfulness in giving, we pay a large part in helping that medical mission to stay open and minister to people that are there as a result of your faithfulness in giving. If you have not yet taken the time, I invite you to look back on the back bulletin board. There are 89 different ministries, foreign missionaries, home missionaries, local ministries here in Harrisonburg and Rockingham County that we support. 89 different ministries that we are able to support on a monthly basis as a result of your faithfulness in your giving. You have the opportunity to give, as, as has already been mentioned twice, with a blood drive. That's coming up. I mean, oh, I know that doesn't have anything to do with money. But you know what? You're giving life. And I've been in situations. I mean, I was too young to remember it. But when I was a baby born, I was a blue, what they call a blue baby. I had to have blood transfusions. It was because of somebody else giving blood that I'm alive today. It's God's faithfulness in honoring those. There's also a missionary book back on the back table that lists the missions and the missionaries that we support. Letters, correspondence letters. I encourage you to read it. It's there by the chair and the sofa in the inner lobby. Read it. Read the correspondence. 
from our missionaries and their letters of appreciation. Because of your faithfulness in giving, we were able to do this. People on drugs through teen challenges, the many different teen challenges that we support. Ava care. Girls that are in a position where they're unmarried and they're finding themselves with a baby or some of them are married but they don't want another child and, and, and because of Ava care and, and the wonderful ministry they have there, they're able to talk these women out of having an abortion. Amen. Escape Ministries, a home for unwed mothers, Kingsway's prison ministries that we support where people are incarcerated but yet every year we do the Apple Tree Project and monthly we support them. First Step, a home for abused women and children. We so faithfully support them. And I could go on and on and on. Look for yourself there on the list. That's why we give. So that as a church, we are a visible representation of God's love to our community and to our world. Amen. That's why the church exists. So I ask you this morning, are you like that little boy? <laughs> Hey, missionary, I heard you preach on giving. Here's my first fish. Where are the others? Oh, they're down on the river. I just haven't caught them yet. Do you really trust God enough to tithe? If you have not yet experienced his blessing, I urge you. I say this to encourage you. I tell you, God is so faithful. You cannot outgive the Lord Untie his hands, see the faithfulness of your God and prove him now and see that God is always faithful in honoring his word. Why do you give? Is it a matter of love or out of obligation? It's a matter of the heart. Pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that you held nothing back. You emptied yourself of all that you were on our behalf that we might have this wonderful gift that's known as eternal life. Knowing that our sins are forgiven, that we're children of the most high God. And Lord, now what you have blessed us with as a steward, as a manager, I pray God that we would not hang on to it so tightly that our fingers had to be pried off of it. But rather, Lord, we release it as unto the glory of God and we honor you with our first fruit that we might see the faithfulness of God in our lives. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I know this was not your typical message that you would hear on a Sunday. But as we were talking about God's willingness to give, talking about God's faithfulness, holding nothing back, giving of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to purchase your salvation and mine on the cross of Calvary, if you have yet to receive this free gift that's known as eternal life, today Jesus is standing here with his arms open wide, telling you to come just as you are. You see, the condition of the heart begins by recognizing that we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but God loved us so much that he gave Jesus on your part and on mine. And today he wants you to come home. He wants you to experience forgiveness. He wants you to experience life, joy. Comes by calling out upon the name of the Lord and asking for forgiveness of your sins, placing your trust in him and not in yourself and receiving this gift of eternal life. If that's you this morning, I'm not gonna drag it out. I'm just gonna simply say, if you need Jesus today, would you raise your hand that we might pray together with you? Anyone at all? You need the Lord today? God's speaking to you? Your heart's not right with the Lord. God's speaking to you. Father, I thank you today so much that you're the searcher of all hearts. My prayer would be that everybody here within the sound of my voice this morning knows you as their personal Savior. If by chance, Lord, there would be an individual here who does not, I pray that in the privacy of this moment that they would call out upon the name of Jesus, asking you for forgiveness of their sins, welcoming you into their life as their Savior and Lord. I pray, God, that we'll take this message to heart, and if there are those that are here, Lord, who have yet to come to 
experience your blessing in their life because of a result of being a faithful tither, I pray that today would be the beginning of that time. That they may purpose that from this day forward, I'm going to honor God with my first fruit. I recognize that the first tenth is His. And I'm trusting God that with His blessing on the other 90%, it's going to go further than the 100% would without His blessing upon it. May we be faithful in service to you that we might be effective in reaching this community with the good news of the gospel and beyond. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.